when I was writing this, I knew that the iPhone does not do great in low light. If it's well lit or you're outdoors, it looks great. But once that sun starts to go down, it doesn't look as good. So I made sure that the planet of Tresmora 1 was actually a uh, tidally locked planet, that it did not rotate. So that was really uh, something that made it even more of a harsh climate for Sorley to live in, is that he had been teleported to a side that faces the star. And sure, the other side is in darkness and in shadows, and he could possibly travel there, but how long would that take him? Would he be able to uh, get somewhere in time before he died? So he had found at least the canyons to live in, to live in shade some of the time, but he was in daylight all the time. And that was something that I wanted to have in there, that he was on a tidally locked planet and that's why it was constantly daylight, which makes it all the more torturous for Sorley to live in. Um, I did, however, later when I wrote the scene about him being in the space station, that was the iPhone in a dark warehouse. And it looks okay. You can see a little bit of the grain, but it was a point uh, during the process that I was like, well, we're just going to have to go for it. I didn't really have uh, sound equipment with my iPhone. I didn't have a boom mic. Um, I borrowed a Zoom recorder from a friend, and then I had a little tiny shotgun mic that I had fixed a rubber band around some PVC pipe, fastened it to a broom pole, and then I had made a makeshift kind of wind filter. They call it a dead cat, but it didn't really work. Um, we had it on this, this pole, and a lot of the time Jason was holding it, trying to get the dialogue, but the wind in the deserts for both days really made the sound on the zoom and captured on this poor uh, poor man's uh, <laughs> boom pole and mic not sound very good. So I was able to fix a lot of the audio and dialogue in post um, with the help of my friend Tim Sloan, who is a very, very uh, talented sound designer. And he helped me fix it and go through and clean a lot of that audio up. And while we were doing it, he was like, you know, next time just call me and uh, I can come out and, and, and do sound for you. So... I'll, I need to remember that, Tim. Also, uh, the, the challenge came up with putting the planet in the sky, and, and people have asked me how I did that. And that was with the marvelous, wonderful help of John Inge. Um, I met John working on I Had a Bloody Good Time at House Harker, and we became very good friends, and he's a very talented visual effects artist. Um, and so he came aboard and helped me because I showed him an early cut where I had used Photoshop to put the planet in the sky, but it was a very uh, frozen shot, still shot. I wasn't able to give it that motion that it needed to look more real and organic in the sky. I had Photoshopped it in there and cut that into the frame. Um, I sent it to him, and then he was able to help me put the planet shots in the film, and it really, I think, took it to the next level, so I couldn't have done that without his help. One of, I think, the stars of intermission is the music, and that is thanks to John Walker. Uh, John was there from the very beginning for, for filming, so he knew where the idea was going, and I think from the very beginning he knew the concept I had in my mind. And within 48 hours of us getting back to L.A., he sent me um, a piece of music that he had composed for intermission, and it it floored me. It blew me away, and I knew it was going to be perfect. And then he just kept sending me track after track. In fact, there's several tracks that I didn't even get to use because he produced about five different pieces of music for me to use. Um, but I think that, honestly, one of my favorite parts about the short is the music that John provided for intermission. <laughs> 